everyone, welcome to the second episode of our podcast, Dermatologist Talks Science of Beauty. I'm Chelsea and I'm really looking forward to having a chat with Dr. Tio Wan Lin, accredited dermatologist, on continuing our dive into how COVID-19 is changing the beauty, skincare, and dermatology world. The topic we're going to be touching on today is something more and more people are experiencing as we face a new normal of wearing face masks in public. The topic will be mask acne or mask day. For our listeners, Dr. Teo recently published the first scientific paper on the diagnostic and management considerations of MASNI in the top dermatology journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, also on her novel area of research, biofunctional textiles, also known as materials for skincare. Since face masks have become a necessary byproduct of the pandemic, I found myself struggling with MASNI, and I'm sure many of our listeners have the same concerns too. Can you tell us a little bit more about MASNI and give us some tips on how to deal with it? Thanks, Chelsea. So MASNI itself is a new term that uh, was coined in 2020 in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, referring to acne that that develops in relation to the wearing of uh, fabric face masks, which are now re- recommended as the primary sort of public health intervention to prevent the um, spread of the COVID virus. Um, it is not a new condition, though. It is really known as acne mechanica, uh, which is a type of infection inflammatory acne and you know before COVID-19 we've seen it in athletes who are wearing facial headgear um, as well in healthcare workers um, who have to wear the N95 mask for long periods of time when they're dealing with um, airborne infectious agents. So The key thing about masne here that's different from all the other types of acne mechanica we've spoken about is that we're talking about the impact of the textile, in this case a fabric mask, on skin and its microenvironment. So specifically, we're going to talk about the uh, concept of textile skin friction. Um, And that's really what's different in masne. Now, we do know now that there are various factors that contribute to the development of acne. But in MASNI, we're talking about how these factors are in relation to the skin microenvironment. So when you're wearing a, a face mask, what happens is that there is accumulation of moisture because of the respiratory, the salivary droplets, Uh, they are recirculating in a somewhat enclosed environment. And depending on where you live, but in tropical Singapore, um, it just becomes incredibly humid and warm because of external temperatures and humidity as well. So these are the environmental factors that will change the balance of bacteria on your skin. And this is something we call the skin microbiome. So the root of masni, as I've discussed in my research letter, it distinguishes it from uh, traditional types of inflammatory acne um, and even uh, other types of acne mechanica is, is really the, the fact that it is an impact on the skin microbiome, specifically what we term as microbiome dysbiosis. So when we are treating MASNI, one has to bear in mind a few uh, epidemiologic factors as well, which is it's going to be a lot more widespread because even someone who has maybe never had acne before will start to get MASNI because of the the chronic textile skin friction and the microenvironment that's created, leading to an imbalance of bacteria. So... Another point to make is that as dermatologists, if we were to treat all these cases of MASNI with um, the traditional topical antibiotic combinations or retinoid combinations, we're going to find ourselves in a bit of trouble, say five to 10 years from now or even earlier. The reason is because the infectious diseases doctors have long warned that the use of topical antibiotics in dermatology can lead to systemic antibiotic resistance. And this is also something that, you know, um, has has not been born out of um, if effective use in a clinical practice. Why do I say that? So, um, you know, for the treatment of um, acne, we, we sometimes prescribe um, topical antibiotics 
such as clindamycin gels in combination with, say, um, benzoyl peroxide or with a retinoid. And in the early, in the short term, in the early period, this, this usually can bring the symptoms of mild acne down. But what happens beyond the second, third month is what I've found in, in clinical practice is that the individual stops responding to these topical antibiotic formulations. And this is why I have moved away from using the synthetic formulas to um, focusing on botanical antioxidants, those have been, which has been proven to have an anti-inflammatory uh, effect. For example, we use an algae extract, which is chlorella, to treat the symptoms of hyperseboria. It controls our production and is also anti-inflammatory. So the, the other thing to consider in masni is we've spoken about the occlusive effect of wearing a face mask, right, in the microenvironment. So in dermatology, the occlusive effect of um, in such an environment can lead to increased absorption of anything you're applying on your skin. Um, so in the case of using a, the traditional uh, anti-acne agents, benzoyl peroxide, retinoids, um, you know, if you've heard of brands like tretinoin um, uh, and adapalin, uh, you know, there are various, gener uh, various um, kind of trade names for these, but I'm just going to talk about the generics. Uh, these will all, without a doubt, cause irritant contact dermatitis when it's worn uh, under a face mask, especially given our uh, humid climate in Singapore. Now, if you do not suffer from acne and even find that you have some dry skin or even, you know, you've been diagnosed with eczema before, you find yourself starting to get bumps around your face. Now, is that always maskne? Um, I think it's really critical for the public to realize that not all rashes, not all bumps that appear under your face mask are masni. So there is a list of differential diagnoses that dermatologists would run through before making a diagnosis of masni. So I propose the first clinical criteria for the diagnosis of masni in this JAD uh, research letter. And uh, it includes, first of all, the uh, onset of the symptoms. So, um, you know, we consider the um, time frame of comedogenesis, which is the development of uh, visible comedones, um, to be around four to six weeks. So um, the, the first thing is it has to fit the, the timing of um, wearing a face mask. So probably between four to six weeks of um, wearing a, uh, a face mask for a long period of time, prolonged period, which is you know commonplace in, in the current pandemic anyway, uh, you start to develop these uh, bumps under your skin. These are acne-like bumps, right? And also the distribution is over the region I characterize as the ozone. So how is the distribution of acne bumps relevant? So in physiological acne, we have the characteristic T-zone predominance with, um, you know, your forehead, the nose area being the more seboric areas, meaning there's a higher concentration of oil glands. And in adult acne, we have um, a pattern that has been previously described as the U-zone, which is, you know, a uh, um, clustering of the acne-like lesions around the jawline. And this is especially common in adult women who uh, may or may not have hormonal issues like polycystic ovaries, but may experience exacerbations in their acne uh, related to their menstrual cycle. Now, the ozone is a visual representation of the area the face mask covers. Now, moving on very quickly to the proposed interventions that can uh, be of significant value in combating the issues relating to masni, as we've described above, would be the concept of biofunctional textiles. So um, Dr. T. W. Biomaterials, of which I am, for, for which I'm the chief scientific officer, was born out of my intense uh, interest and research into the arena of textile cosmeceuticals um, as a branch out from our main cosmeceutical research and development arm, Dr. T. W. Dermaceuticals. So 
So um, it was born last year and we work with material scientists and um, a pharmaceutical engineer who is also a, a qualified chemical engineer to come up with novel textiles with skin benefits. So in this research letter, I spoke about the potential of the use of such textiles. So we do know of our uh, copper infused nanoparticle uh, fabric face mask that's made of a synthetic silk mimic. So that means that it's a lot more durable than ordinary silk, which I do not recommend, um, you know, as a face mask because simply because it's not very durable. And the function of a face mask is it has to be able to withstand laundering. And laundering is an important aspect of maintaining hygiene, both for your skin and also for the purposes of, you know, the preventing the spread of COVID. Um, and with structural disintegration of the fabric, that's the last thing you want in a fabric face mask, which really is meant to keep your, you know, for you to keep your, your fluids to yourself. Um, so this copper silk um, alternative has the benefit of uh, stimulating collagen production um, based on the benefits of copper, which we spoke about earlier. And it also has broad spectrum antimicrobial effects, which means that it can control the balance of microorganisms, of germs, in particular, the bacteria that's involved in acne. Okay, So, you know, we've heard about P. acnes, but we've also known in recent dermatological research that it's not just P. acnes. We have um, an evolving organism known as C. acnes. So the important thing is instead of using various topical antibiotics, which are of questionable long-term efficacy anyway, um, we should perhaps switch to a preventive measure. And because of the very nature of textiles having the longest contact time with the skin, it is a reasonable alternative for us to focus our research efforts into. You're absolutely right. Prevention is always better than cure. Thank you again for sharing all of these tips with us, Dr. Tio, and that about sums up our episode. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you guys on the next episode.